editing, you have to uh, consider discussing crop, uh, how it is being regulated, how it would be regulated, how people would percept it. Uh, and if people is the ultimate uh, user of this technology, uh, we scientists develop uh, in lab, but the perception is totally dependent on people. So it is, uh, it is a highly relevant matter. So, you know, if I want to give you a snapshot of how it is, uh, how the global community is uh, actually seeing it. So they, de they divided the genome editing technologies, uh, derived crops or organism into three different uh, types. One is SDN1, another is SDN2, and another is SDN3. This is in SDN1, that I mostly discussed that when you use a Cas9, then you make a cut and the random insertion deletion causes the knockout. So it is an, random insertion deletion is one base pair, two base pair, maybe two to three base pair, okay? So here you can see this extra insertion and deletion. So this is treated as, this is called as SD, SDN1. And SDN2 and SDN3 are uh, the two classes when you, go for homology directed repair. I told you there are two pathways, one is NHEJ, another is homology directed repair. So homology directed repair, if you want to go for, you have to supply a donor template from the outside, okay? So if you use a donor template, then it would be classified as SDN2 and SDN3. And now this SDN2 and SDN3, SDN3 is if you are knocking in a large fragment of gene, then it is called SDN3. Uh, if, you, uh, uh, if you're changing few base pair using a donor template, then it is SDN2. But mostly SDN3 is regarded as GMOs by most of the uh, uh, regulatory bodies around the world. But SDN1 and SDN2, they are most likely to be escaped from the regulatory uh, uh, red tape of GMOs. So if you see the available policies, uh, USA, Canada, Argentina, Brazil, and those all countries, including European Union, they all have already decided about the policies, how to regulate genome edited crops. But the policies in development in uh, our countries, like India, China, Philippines, Japan, and others. Uh, but if you see the scenario, uh, in case of, uh, uh, if I go back to this slide, so all other countries have a very positive note towards uh, deregulating GE crops from SDN1 and SDN2, except the European Union. And uh, uh, I know India has already uh, drafted a proposal of regulatory proposal, and they got public comment on it. And uh, uh, they are in process of developing a regulatory rules for generated crops. So if you say <clears throat> uh, gene edited CRISPR mushroom escapes US regulation, the mushroom I was talking about, the uh, non-browning mushroom, uh, uh, USDA and other regulatory bodies in USA, they are saying that it, it is not at all would be regulated because it does not contain any foreign, uh, foreign insertion. It is only few base pair changes in the PPO genes, okay? Uh, <clears throat> so if you see Australian gene editing rules adopt middle ground, Australia also is deregulating SDN1, but the other is regulated. So likewise, Japan also, they decided in 2019, that gene edited foods are safe and Japanese panel also recommend for deregulating gene edited crops, but they have not come out with a policy, uh, concrete policy till now. But all of, mo most of them are positive, but in contrast to European Union, these European Union, what they say, they say that organisms obtained by mutagenesis are GMOs and are in principle subject to obligations laid down by the GMO directive. So e European Union is negative uh, towards gene edited crops and this has been highly criticized by all over the world scientists because you know when they say that uh, the product which is coming from gamma radiation of random mutagenesis, which has high likelihood of getting the uh, different portions of the whole genome is mutated. They're not regulating it, but when you are uh, mutating a 
targeted precise mutation in, in one of your single gene, then it is regarded or regulated. So it is uh, highly uh, some kind of, uh, uh, you know, from a scientific perspective, it is highly um, surprising, you know. Uh, so if you see how regulatory uh, frameworks, uh, how regulatory bodies actually decide. So there are two kind of regulation. One is process-based, another is product-based. So process-based mean uh, they go for the techniques, what has been used to develop the product, okay? If recombinant DNA technology used, recombinant DNA technology means if cloning is involved, the variety would be regulated as a GMO. And it is the case of European Union, India, and China. But if you see in other countries like USA, Canada, Argentina, and other Latin American countries, they go for product-based uh, regulation. They see the product which has been developed. They see the inherent risk of the final product. And that is the sole thing they consider. And they also go for uh, um, analyzing potential risk of the new trade to the public and environment. So the example country is US and Canada. If the final product does not contain in any foreign, pro foreign gene or foreign DNA inserted, so then it is free of any GMO regulations. But that is not the case for India and China. So now the question is how to obtain transgene free edited crops. Here are some examples. So integration of construct into the genome. So if you see, uh, if your Cas9 here, Cas9 is integrated suppose in chromosome one, and now this, you designed an RNA, guide RNA, and your target is present in chromosome seven. Now, the Cas9 will produce DNA, the Cas9 will produce protein here, and take the RNA, guide RNA and Cas9 complex, and they go to the target chromosome seven, and th then they make a cut, and the mutation happens, okay? So now, when the target is mutated, now the Cas9 is not needed, is no longer needed to be present in the genome. So in the next generation, you could segregate out, you could select only for the mutant, not for the Cas9. In normal sexual segregation, the Cas9 would be segregated out and you select only for the mutant one. So you have the mutant plant, and no Cas9 inserted, okay? So this is called uh, uh, Mendel, uh, sexual segregation. Now you could achieve the same as transient DNA delivery. Uh, so uh, if, you, if you are not going to uh, integrate them into the genome, but you express the DNA construct for a while, uh, uh, means until it makes a cut and causes the mutation. For a, for a very short period of time. So you are not going to integrate the DNA construct into the genome, then this is called transgene DNA uh, expression. And before it is integrated, the, the DNA would be uh, degraded. DNA means the Cas9 construct would be degraded. So your work is done because the time you have given, in that time, the Cas9 produces protein and it causes the mutation. Uh, then the Cas9 construct is degraded. So this is called transgenic one. So you don't have any problem with integration. Now you could go for RNP mediated transformation that is called ribonucleoprotein. So you design, uh, you isolate or you uh, purify the Cas9 protein and you also in vitro transcribe the RNA, the guide RNA. And you mix them and you deliver them inside your cell. So there is no DNA you are inserting into the cell. So you're inserting into the cell some protein and some RNA. So we know that protein and RNA would not be integrated into the cell in normal cases. So this is case, in this case, you would not have any kind of uh, integration of any foreign gene. Another is also you could achieve transient delivery of Cas9 and RNA by using viral vectors. Because in normal cases, viral vectors typically do not integrate into the plant genome. So the mutant plant, mutated plants will not be transgenic. Uh, so now this is the conclusion of my presentation. Uh, so for the part one that I talked about, the genome editing has unprecedented ability to generate targeted and specific mutations in almost every loci. 
and uh, you could do knockout and other kind of point mutation like A to G or C to T, and you could develop rapid targeted genetic diversity uh, by using this technology. Uh, this simple, uh, versatile, and efficient tools are revolutionizing precision plant breeding and uh, biological studies, and it is rapidly accelerating the crop improvement. And it could be a boon for agricultural production and food security. Uh, like I told you, the example of cassava, rice, and wheat, all those examples. And now in part three, uh, during the regulation, what I should say, the most of the countries deregulated genome edited crops till now, except the European Union. But you know, biotechnology, familiarity, and perceptions of safety would drive the acceptance. So we have to, uh, actually, what BioEngine bio is doing is a great job to communicate with the wider audience about the technology, the real knowledge, the real scientific knowledge. Uh, uh, so uh, I appreciate the effort from BioEngine. Uh, so we have to educate people uh, with the real knowledge, not the unscientific argument, you know. Uh, if, uh, so. So we should be more careful to about what happened with GMOs because a lot of people just said that, oh, GMOs is very bad and all these kind of things. And I discussed you about mutation breeding, how dangerous it is to treat the whole plant with the gamma radiation. And then you go for selection and you get a, get a plant and that plant might have been mutated in several other portions. You don't know because that has never been analyzed. It goes directly to commercialization, okay? And now if you isolate a single gene, which has been proved for a longer time, which have been studied from 50 years, that this gene is safe to use. And then when you insert that gene into your crop, uh, that becomes a GMO and how it is causing fear to us, I don't know. And if you come to genome edited crops, it is more precise when you got to change one or single nucleotide that is already present there. So it is not at all also a foreign insertion in some cases. So it should not be treated uh, as it has, been tre uh, it has been done with GMOs. So we have to communicate well with the people. Uh, so to know more, you could go for my, my few publications. So these are all things. Uh, uh, if you want to apply in your experiment, so, so this method book is coming soon. Uh, there you would get to know what are the protocols you have to follow uh, to apply in uh, this technology to your crop of interest. Uh, you could read this blog in Argin, uh, you could find me there. Uh, you could go for, if you want to know uh, more about base editing, you could go for this uh, exhaustive review in uh, uh, trends in biotech. Uh, and then we, we wrote a forum article about this predicting stuff, predicting CRISPR-Cas9 induced mutations uh, by machine learning. So you could go for, to that article if you want to design a better experiment uh, for your uh, upcoming um, study. Uh, so I, I acknowledge uh, my uh, postdoc supervisor, Professor Yinong Yang at Penn State, and also obviously Indian Council of Agricultural Research, uh, National Rice Research Institute, and then uh, the full writer obviously who has funded me uh, for my postdoc and introducing me to a fascinating area of crop improvement. Uh, we are now applying those kind of technologies in our crop improvement program in NLRI. So we are hopeful to come out with a very good and exciting thing soon. Uh, and we'll be sharing with you obviously. Uh, thank you very much uh, for your attention. Uh, and it's to you, Liberty, Jacinda, Shubho, Neha, Shumi.